people. Welcome to this uh, week's Wednesday Theology Study. And um, we've been talking about conversion and that that means turning in terms of uh, faith and repentance. We re Repentance, we turn away from things that are wrong, from sin, and in faith we turn towards Christ. And uh, we talked last week about uh, saving knowledge involves uh, knowledge of the gospel, who Jesus is, and what he's done for us, and approval of that message, a agreement. And today we want to talk about putting our personal trust in him. And uh, <clears throat> we must know who Christ is and what he's done, and that's knowledge, and we must be in agreement. However, that is not a alone, that's not enough. That uh, since salvation is ultimately a work of Christ, then it stands to reason we must um, come to put our trust in the saving work of Christ. As I mentioned in the last video, often people um, have put their dependence in their ability to apply the truth. Uh, forgetting that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And and that's one of those things we, we come back to. We should follow the word. We And we will be blessed if we do. But the Bible isn't a self-help help book that you get just to better yourself. The Bible is the living, breathing Word of God that exposes the mind of Christ. And, and its purpose is to lead us to a saving faith that ultimately meaning means we put our trust in the person of Jesus Christ, not just the principles of Jesus Christ. And there are groups, there are even atheists out there that apply the principles of Jesus Christ without believing in the person of Jesus Christ. And, and that does that comes to nothing. That's not saving. It might help you on this earth a bit, but it won't save your soul. Now, um, when I think about putting a personal trust in the Lord, I come to this understanding that I must decide to depend on Jesus to save me personally. Now notice that word personally. This is not a generic belief in the gospel message for the corporate body of Christ. The all who come message, which, which we preach so that people know everyone's welcome to come to Jesus. But the belief that I have as an individual who's saved is not just in this big message. It's that Jesus actually does the saving work in my life personally. And sometimes it's uh, easier for uh, people to believe in God's saving work in someone else's life because you don't see the nitty-gritty of someone else's life. You see the nitty-gritty of your life. You see all your failures. You see your thoughts. You see your temptations. And you see your struggles. And your, your awareness of the shortcomings involved are much higher and sharper when you look at your own life than someone you don't know as well. And in that context, it really becomes important to remember we have a Savior. And we must trust Him to save us in all of our malady and weakness. And uh, that's, that's the message of the gospel. That's grace. And, and so we begin to see that. This is me depending on Jesus for my salvation. And anyone who's familiar with me and, and the, way, the way I preach on a regular basis knows that I don't often talk about the individual or individualizing things that much. I talk. I speak more about the body of Christ. I was glad when they said unto us, unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. And Jesus saying, our Father who art in heaven, that it's not just about you, it's about all of us. But when it comes to personal salvation, this is an individual thing. And I have to trust the work of Jesus in my individual life for salvation. And that's what motivates me to keep coming to the throne room. And, and I, th I think we want to remember that. And, and so there we are. In doing this, I move from being an interested observer to being a participant in relationship with Jesus. So as long as I'm, you know, uh, I, I'm developing knowledge about the gospel and church and Christ and who he is, and I'm approving those messages, I'm certainly an interested observer of the gospel. But it's only when I receive Christ as my personal Savior, deciding to put my trust in him completely, and that I'm doing this with Jesus, I'm going all the way with Jesus, that's 
when I take it to a next step. That I'm having a relationship with him. And now I'm involved. I'm not just observing the message. I'm, I'm experiencing the message. And, and so it, it takes the knowledge and the approval that we have about the gospel and it makes it very real. Uh, and, and so it's one thing for me to say, I know Jesus died to save people, and I agree with that message. But then it becomes real when I, I understand he is saving me and I'm in a relationship with him. And, and Christianity, you know, what separates us out is that it is a faith for real people in a real world. That it isn't, it isn't some religious theory it's not a mental exercise. It's not just a, a book of principles that you can apply to improve your life, which is an unfortunate approach to evangelism. You know, people are always trying to evangelize others by telling them, you'll have a better life if you become a Christian. Um, you know, Paul was beheaded and Peter was hung upside down and John was banished on Patmos. And, and, and those guys weren't out there saying, oh, you'll... Your life on earth will be better. Um, you know, Paul said, we apostles are treated like the garbage of the earth. Um, that's not him saying, my life on earth is better. What they were saying is, you need a savior because God is real. There's an eternal judgment. There's also eternal reward. Put your trust in Jesus for that eternal reward. That's not the message of self-help. That's the message of redemption. And it's a completely different message. And, and you say, well, people won't buy that. Anyone that God is drawing to Jesus will come to Jesus. This is a supernatural thing that Christ does. It's the work of Christ, not the work of man. And we want to come back to that and, and believing in the power and living by the power that is in redemption. And so that's why I say Christianity is for real people. Real messed up people, people who know their failures, people who can't get into the kingdom any other way but through the blood of Jesus. That's what Christianity is for. And incidentally, that's everyone. Uh, so let's, on the basis of this knowledge, define saving faith. Saving faith is trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for forgiveness of sins and eternal life with God. So that, that's saving faith. Uh, and I'll, I'll just repeat it. Saving faith is trust in Jesus Christ as a living person for the forgiveness of sins and for eternal life with God. That's what he's done for us. Notice that this definition is, is not just a belief in facts about Jesus, but in the person of Jesus. Thus, indoctrination is not what is essential to saving faith, but relationship is what is essential to saving faith. Understandably, salvation is more than just the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. I understand that. However, those are the two utmost concerns for people coming to Christ, the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Consequently, for now, that is what we will look at and the other aspects can be discussed later. So trust is, when we think about saving faith, uh, I would say trust is a better word choice in our current culture than faith. And, and not because faith isn't real, but because faith, uh, the, the def faith has been redefined so many different ways by so many different people, uh, particularly in the religious community, that to really comprehend this idea behind saving faith we're going to think in terms of personal trust. And, and uh, you know, um, we see that our definition emphasizes personal trust in Christ. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Uh, faith is a term that has been somewhat profaned uh, from its original meaning through religion. And so when we look, that's why we're talking about trust. The problem is we can believe something is true without trusting Jesus. So faith has to be more than, saving faith has to be more than belief about, but trust in. And that's, that's why I'm making that semantic distinction. And we can have faith and believe by today's standards without personal commitment. People do it all the time. They believe all kinds of things without personal commitment. Um, 
A trust, on the other hand, implies risk and action. And, and that's, that's very different, isn't it? Uh, so thus we see trust as coming closer to the biblical idea of faith. That's why we're talking about trust. Uh, if we were to go back and really look into the biblical idea of faith, too many have turned faith into a mental exercise whereby you convince yourself of something. You know, I choose to believe these things. Uh, that's not faith. That's convincing yourself of something. Uh, it's not mind over matter. You know, when you think of what the, unfortunately, what the Word of Faith movement has done with the concept of faith, you know, that I'm going to tell myself it's true and I'm going to demand it and I'm going to play this mental power game where my mind says it's going to happen until it does, you become your own miracle worker at that point. Then you say, I had faith, I believe. You know what? If there's a miracle, because of my prayers, it will be Jesus who does that miracle, not my puny little brain. And and that's the problem. We have defined faith. To continue that, let's look at John 3.16. God loved the world this way. He gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not die, but will have eternal life. Now, this verse is a primary and basic text for saving faith that we use to witness. It's, it's, it's one of our texts that we use. It's foundational in stating what we believe about the work of Jesus. And note it identifies belief in him. And, 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 the, the word, of course, in Greek, it's, it's pistuo eis auton, which could be translated belief into him. Uh, or, and when we see that, it's not belief about him, but belief in him as the person of Jesus Christ. This is, this is absolutely relational. I have a Savior, and I know that Savior. Our Western mind... Western mind, possible oxymoron, tells us that knowledge is power, but in God's kingdom, relationship is power. God didn't let Samuel's words fall to the ground. We, we look at that. That's 1 Samuel 3, 19. You can consider it. And we, it says, you know, God didn't let any of Samuel's words fall to the ground, which meant he supported what Samuel said. Was that because he was right about everything? or in right relationship with God. Well, you know, we know that Samuel was a person like us, and therefore he couldn't have been right about everything. We know he had some bad parenting problems when it came to dealing with his sons and letting them continue as corrupt leaders, etc. So, so yet, because of the relationship, Samuel was an omniscient, all-knowing. He had to make mistakes. And yet, God didn't let his words fall to the ground. Why? Because of relationship. Because Samuel sought the Lord and, and he endeavored to be right with him. And, and thus, it's not what you know in the kingdom, but who you know. And that who is Jesus Christ. Jesus speaks to us of coming to him. In his own message about himself, if we were to look at that, and I'm just going to use three Scriptures from uh, John and Matthew, the Gospels. John 6, 37 says this, Everyone, and this is Jesus speaking, Everyone whom the Father gives me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. And notice it's not comes into knowledge. It's coming to the person of Jesus Christ. And John seven thirty seven says this, On the last moment in the most important day of the festival, Jesus was standing in the temple courtyard. He said loudly, whoever is thirsty must come to me to drink. Come to me. If you're thirsty, you come to Jesus, not knowledge. That's the difference. Knowledge is important, and we should study to so show ourselves approved. But ultimately, salvation is about the work of Jesus, the Savior in your personal life. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 says this, Come to me, all who are tired from carrying heavy loads, and I will give you rest. Place my yoke on your shoulders. Learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble. Then you will find rest for yourselves, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so, again, coming to Jesus. 
And, and the distinction when we see in that verse I, is just the other day, uh, I was looking at that passage and thinking, well, Lord, if if your uh, yoke is easy and your burden is light, why has it been sometimes that Christianity seems so hard? Uh, and, and the reason is because we make it about what we're doing based on our knowledge instead of what he has done in us and how he's transforming us. You know, in Philippians, it says, he who has begun a good work, and you will be faithful to complete it to the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not you doing the work in you. It's Jesus doing the work in you. Yes, you bring your effort and you read the scriptures and you strive to obey them. But the fruit is from the Lord. One man plants, one waters. God gives the increase. That's what we want to always come back to. It's this personal relationship with Christ. We see here that Jesus preached a gospel message that was all about coming to him. We are called to him. We have created this phrase in the church about coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And it's an accurate phrase if we understand that the knowledge is relational, right? Unfortunately, um, when we think of knowledge in the Western mind, we think of intellect rather than uh, relational experience with the Savior. And, and so we, we must understand it's relationship-based knowledge when people speak of saving knowledge. Knowing the law is one thing, but knowing the lawgiver and the life giver is quite another. And, and so this leads us to one conclusion. That faith should increase our as our knowledge increases. And, and, you know, as I read the Word and as I grow in Christ and as I walk with Him, have my devotions and worship Him, my knowledge of Him is increasing and my, uh, my faith in Him should be increasing simultaneously. That's what should be happening. And, and I would say in my personal experience, I think it does. I, I, I have to say my... My faith and confidence in the person of Jesus Christ is is greater than it's ever been when I look back over my history of salvation. Now, remember, if I'm defining faith with that accurate term trust, it makes so much more sense that I'm not putting my faith in miracles. I'm not putting my faith in prayer as prayer. I'm putting my faith in Jesus, the one whom I pray to, and he is the miracle worker. So my faith is absolutely confident in him. Not all this other religious stuff that people create. And, and so that's the distinction. Now, this is true because we're speaking of Jesus Christ, that if our knowledge of him increases, our faith and confidence in him, our trust in him should increase. Now, understandably, there are two kinds of people, and some inspire confidence, and, well, you know, some don't. <clears throat> now, uh, when I think of my increased knowledge of untrustworthy people, right, it leads to a lack of trust. If I think of people who fail often, who never follow through on their word, who give up all the time, who flake out and aren't there for me, the more I know them, the less I trust them. That's logical. But we're talking about Jesus. We're talking about God. Consequently, our knowledge of the Lord and his word and ways leads to a greater trust because he never fails. That's why I, I speak so often to people about reading scripture, that reading, you know, my personal opinion, people read whatever they feel they can do. But, you know, you should be reading the Bible, uh, even if it's a chapter a day, you should be reading the Bible, not a devotional book. Uh, but the Bible, the, the living word of God. Problem is some devotion books are fine, but they're, they always, you know, you get a verse and that person's belief about that verse, instead of just reading the word and letting it wash over you because the word itself is a miracle. Um, that's where you grow in knowledge because what we're about to see, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word, uh, the, that which Christ speaks. And, and I want to look at that. So Romans ten seventeen. So faith comes from hearing the message, and the message that is heard is what Christ spoke. 
Uh, and, and you say, oh, it's the word. Well, in the original language, the, the Greek term for word in that case is rhema, and it's this its idea of utterance, all right? So it's appropriate to say that the message Christ spoke, uh, thus word. So I would continue, faith comes by what Christ speaks. And, and how many uh, Christians, how many of us could have that testimony that I've walked with the Lord, I've read my Bible, I've worshiped him, and in those difficult moments, I received, you know, the Lord whispered to me, and it's that, that utterance that, that gave me more faith to press on. And, and so we see that continues, that, that it's not just based on what God Christ has spoken. Now, the, word of, the written word is something we use to evaluate those things we currently hear from the Lord to make sure there's no contradiction. Uh, James, John 16, verse 13, Jesus said this, When the Spirit of truth comes, it's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into the full truth. He won't speak on his own. He will speak what he hears and will tell you about things to come. So the, the Holy Spirit is speaking what he's hearing from the from God. And, and particularly, there's another passage where Jesus says he takes what he hears from me and gives it to you. And, and, and so we begin to realize that the Holy Spirit is, is br still bringing the utterance of Christ to the church. And, and here's an indication that knowledge leads to more faith, more trust. And, and that's what Christ wants to do. But but it's all tied into this point of relationship with Jesus Christ. I personally put my trust in the person of Jesus Christ and who he is. So that's it for the today. Next time we'll look at the balance of faith and repentance and how those work together. Lord bless you.